who are gathered at home and abroad who have joined us this morning for worship. This is the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas, Guyana District. And we welcome you to another blessed Lord's Day worship service. Thank you all for joining us, especially on this significant day in the life of our church, Elders Gate Lord's Day, where we commemorate the high spiritual experiences of John and Charles Wesley, which occurred in May 1738. This stirred up their missionary undertakings, and the church and the family of the people called Methodists was born. Charles was the first to have had a life-changing experience on Whit Sunday, the 21st of May, 1738. Due to illness, he was confined to bed. On that day, he prayed for the gift of the Comforter. Seeking to sleep, he heard a voice say, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and believe, thou shalt be healed of thy infirmities. It was the voice of one Mr. who told him, I, a weak, sinful creature, spoke, but the words were Christ. He commanded me to say them, and so constrained me that I could not forbear. Charles Wesley found and felt the assurance he was seeking. While she was speaking, he said, I now found myself at peace with God and rejoice in hope of loving Christ. Two days later, Charles wrote his conversion hymn, Where Shall My Wandering Soul Begin? John rejoiced with his brother in his Pentecost experience, though he too was searching. However, by Wednesday, the 24th of May, it brought an end to this. Throughout the day, John found scriptures and heard songs which spoke of God's love. They sought to offer him peace in his soul. In the evening, he went very unwillingly to a meeting in Aldersgate Street, where someone was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. While the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ was being described, John wrote, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ, Jesus alone, for salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Today, as we rejoice in the wonderful work of grace wrought in the lives of John and Charles Wesley, our Almighty God, in a time of great need, raised up these faithful men of the Word of God and His ministry, and that the Holy Spirit inspired them to kindle a flame of sacred love, which leaped and ran an inextinguishable blaze. The fire, thanks be to God, came to us in the Caribbean and was fanned by many a faithful men and women. Of note, we pause to recognize and give thanks for the life of our very own the late Reverend Bella Spencer, who ran faithfully with the flame of Methodism as she proclaimed the glories of life in God's kingdom. Today, as we praise God through him singing our prayers and the spoken word of God, may all those whose hearts have been warmed at these altar fires be continually refreshed by God's grace and may we be so devoted to the increase of spreading scriptural holiness throughout the land. And now we join together as we say the call to worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, full of grace and mercy. The old earth is full of his glory. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall show forth your praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And as we lift our voices and we give praises to our God, we sing the hymn, Jesus, the name I over all, number 49 in our VIP.
Lord, for that wonderful hymn of praise, Jesus, the name I over all. And at this time, we continue in giving God our highest praises as we quiet our souls and we go to him in prayer. We pray the prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Great God, you are awesome. You are excellent. And we, Lord, your name, henceforth, now and forevermore, you are God. You are all powerful and there is no one else who is like unto you. So we bless your name today. We confer to you the honor that is due unto your name. We celebrate you with all that we possess, almighty God. We give it to you. We say, take all the glory. It is yours. Your splendor is not hidden from our eyes. We see it every day, every waking moment. We hear it, O oh God, in the different sounds of your amazing creation. And we blend our voices with the heavenly host and we say, yes, our God is good. And so God, while we confer to you our adoration, while we give you, O oh God, the praise that is due unto you, we pause. We quiet ourselves and we examine the inner being. God, we have not always lived up to the mark of our confession. And so today, gracious God, we ask that you but search us. We ask dear Lord God that for all the times that we would have fallen short of your glory, for all the times, dear Lord God, when we refuse to take up the mandate to spread scriptural holiness and to fan the flame that you have made a reveal to our hearts we ask for your forgiveness we pray gracious god for all those opportunities for ministry that we have come with a very casual and lackluster approach gracious god let you forgive us forgive us oh god and Give us the grace that we need to go forward in faith. Forward, O oh God, full of renewed zeal to declare there is a God to be glorified. And so, God, we know that you are faithful. We know, dear Lord God, that you are just. And so, today, we receive the forgiveness that you have given unto us. And we accept the mandate, even now, in this consecrated hour, to go in peace and sin no more. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen and amen. And so, having confessed our sins, we join in a litany of thanksgiving unto our God. Let us pray. The psalmist reminds us that it is a good thing to give thanks to you, O Lord, and to sing praises to your name. O Lord, we declare your steadfast love in the morning, and in the evening our prayers will ring out with thanks for your faithfulness. I will praise and thank you, O Lord, as long as I live. Almighty God, the giver of all good gifts, we thank you for pardoning us. We thank you, Lord, for your love that you have so unreservedly revealed to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Accept our gracious thanks, O Lord. We thank you for the power of the gospel and your life-giving Holy Spirit who continues to convict us of our sins and call us to a deeper relationship in you. We, we rejoice, rejoice in you and, and give thanks, thanks O oh Lord. Thank you. O oh Lord, for this day when we celebrate our heritage as a people called Methodist, thank you for raising up, up the Wesleys and all those who came before us who proclaimed the good news of repentance and scriptural holiness. Thank you for the power of their preaching, the challenge of their dedicated lives, and the continuing inspiration of their hymns. We rejoice in you and give you thanks, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the privilege you have given to us to be your witnesses in our time. Thank 
thank you for equipping us with your Holy Spirit's power. Give us the grace to serve you in true holiness and sincerity all the days of our life, that our lives and witnesses, and that our lives and witnesses, that through our lives and witnesses, others may be one to you. Accept our thanks, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. And amen. And so we have given God the thanks that is due unto his name because he is a faithful God. And I know that you have experienced the faithfulness of God. And I know that your hearts have been swelling over these last days with gratitude. And we continue in this rich worship as we sing to our true God. My God, I know I feel the mind. Number 228. <laughs> inspiration in their struggle we can see how people that living people still remember live out their Christian faith and we see people like ourselves let me go right away to a lady because we'll find that women have featured prominently in the development and the spread of Methodism this particular woman is responsible for the growth, the spread of Methodism to Korea, one of the prominent people, at a time when women were not even thought worthy of being educated in Korea. Let me tell you how one of our prominent speakers and writers of the Christian faith, Vishal Mangalwari, remembers her. He says, while the women's, women's foreign ministry, Missionary Society of the Methodist 
Episcopal Church discussed plans for Japan and China, an elderly woman beseeched her peers not to overlook the little kingdom nestled between the two Asian giants on the Korean Peninsula. Three years later, on the 31st of May 1886, Mary Scranton, a 52-year-old Methodist missionary, began Korea's first school for women. It was not easy for her to find female students. The only student willing to risk social disapproval was the king's concubine. By 1887, Mary had seven students, and Korean Emperor Gojong's wife, Min Bi, named the school Iwa Handa, or Pear Blossom School. Labors such as hers helped turn that little kingdom into one of Asia's greatest countries. You can see how she looks, and you can see how the school looks now. As you can see, it is a wide expanse. And you can find that in Vishal's book, the book that made your world, how the Bible created the soul of Western civilization. We go now to another Korean personality. Well, he was an American missionary and he's referred to there as the second John Wesley, the Korean Wesley. Just about one year after Mary Scranton arrived, Another American missionary would be called the Korean Wesley went there and started another Methodist institution, Henry G. Appenzeller, together with his wife Ella, and in company with Presbyterian Horace G. Underwood, set foot on dry ground at Chemulpo, present day Incheon, on Easter Day, April 5, 1885. From that time until his tragic death in a steamship collision off the coast of Korea in June 1902. Appenzella participated in founding Methodist congregations, defended Korean independence from Chinese, French, English, Japanese, and Russian imperialism, promoted democracy, and founded the first Western educational institution in Korea, Pai Chai Hakda. Appenzella's school introduced Western education to Korea and graduated many leaders of the Korean Republic. And this included Sigmund Rhee, the first president of the Republic. Ella Appenzeller assisted Mary Scranton in the founding of Ewa Women's University, an excellent women's university in Seoul, which conducted its centennial celebrations in June 1986. And what about William Albright? You know, what we don't hear about, in fact, I was wondering why they see seems to be such a drought of Methodist writers. Well, this gentleman, William Foxwell Albright, apparently was quite a prolific writer. He's a biblical archaeologist. Let me break that down. An archaeologist is one who digs the earth in order to find evidence of what transpired hundreds, thousands of years ago. And if the Bible is correct, it's the same earth we are living on, and therefore we ought to be able to find because these sites have become buried. And that is what biblical archaeology is about with that purpose. And what many people don't tell you, the secular archaeology uh, area, is that many of them are armed secretly with the Bible because they know the Bible is true. And they go and they use the Bible quietly to go and find out where to dig. So this gentleman, William Foxwell Albright, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, he was appointed fellow of the American School of Oriental Research, Jerusalem, in 1919. He served as the school's director for 12 years. Among his excavations were Gibeah of Saul, and in association with others, Beth Zur and Bethel in Palestine, and Malua and Petra in Jordan. In 1950-51, he was chief archaeologist of excavations made by the American Foundation for the Study of Man at Wadi Beha and Timna in Arabia. Albright early stressed the value of archaeology and of topographical and linguistic studies for biblical history and in making pottery and pottery in the identification a reliable scientific tool. 
appointed fellow of the American School of Oriental Research, Jerusalem, in 1990, 1919. He served as the school's director for 12 years. And he stressed the value of archaeology and of topographical and linguistic studies for biblical history and in making pottery and pot shirt identification a reliable scientific tool. His scientific writings greatly influenced the development of biblical and related Middle Eastern scholarship and include the archaeology of Palestine and the Bible, 1932 to 1935, the vocalization of the Egyptian Syllabic orthography, 1934, the excavation of Tel Bait Mirsin, 32 to 43, and so on. He was the son of American Methodist missionaries living abroad. Albright came with his family to the United States in 1903. That should be wet because we're not there. We go now to a hymn writer. The Methodist heroes include a number of hymn writers. Of course, you know the most prominent one is the brother of our founder, John Wesley, who wrote thousands of hymns. And this one is a Reverend George Bernard. He wrote the old rugged cross and confronted Christendom with a certain perspective, a certain way of looking at Christianity that many have forgotten. You see, in 1913, Reverend George Bernard, an American Methodist minister, was pondering, he was studying, it was on his mind, the problem that greatly exercised his mind. His thoughts went back repeatedly to Christ's passion on the cross. This belief, Bernard, was the very heart of the gospel. The cross he pictured was made from precious metal or marble or polished wood. It was rough and crude and ugly and was stained with blood and gore. Bernard was troubled by the ornate artistic crosses that featured in countless churches and cathedrals. He later wrote, quote, I saw the Christ of the cross as if I were seeing John 3, 16 leave the printed page, take form and act out the meaning of redemption, unquote. Bernard was a Methodist evangelist and was due to preach at a series of meetings in New York. His song immediately became hugely popular around the world, but has always been regarded with suspicion in certain circles. The old rugged cross is about a symbol and an event that is not respectable. It's not nice. In fact, when we think about it, it's scandalous and it's horrible. This is the very point that St. Paul was trying to make when he wrote to the Christians at Corinth. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The Anabaptist writer Stuart Murray Williams suggests that a subtle but very important shift took place at the time of Constantine. The cross is superseded by the Cairo monogram as a symbol of the faith. Christianity became then the religion of the powerful and the respectable. They don't wish to be reminded of the scandalous roots of their faith. That is what that cross is about. It brings us back to the reality of what the cross really was. And that is through a Methodist hymn writer. Let's go now to James Cawhey. I had to go and look this up, how to pronounce it. Like I've looked up several of these things here. They're not my cre creations. I always tell people, whenever I bring something from the internet, I will tell you it's from the internet. So much of this is from the internet, except from the book on, from Mangalwadi that I told you about Scranton. So James Corby or Corby is the American scholar. We hear about the holiness movement and it was driven by Methodists, mainly by Methodists. That movement birthed in the Pentecostal church. This was true then, Azusa Street Revival. But before Azusa Street came James Corby, who was he? He was a revivalist. He was later ordained in, he was ordained in 84 as deacon and after two more years was finally ordained as an elder of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Initially he seemed to be merely another sincere but quite ordinary Methodist preacher. His first ministry labors were not distinguished by any uncommon results. Then he recognized he needed the Holy Spirit to work the results he wanted to see. For nearly seven years thereafter, Corby was the ordained means of sparking revival in one industrial city after another all across Britain. Throughout this continuous season of revival, he preached on an average of six to ten times a week. 
resulting in 22,000 souls converted and thousands more refreshed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Mr. Covey's revival ministry repeatedly emptied the public drinking houses and miraculously transformed entire communities. Most of his converts were young people between the ages of 16 and 30 years. One of those converts was a tall and gangly youth named William Booth, who after his conversion immediately began to be preaching in the forgotten city slums of England. You would recognize William Booth as the founder of the Salvation Army. Both of these men's stories reveal something about Methodism. We seem to have difficulty in recognizing the work of the Holy Spirit and the separation results. For the move to come to fruition. There were all kinds of criticism by the official church against jumping up and down and moaning and shouting. John Leslie had the same problem if you remember. This is our own Caribbean Rosa Parks, who by the way was Methodist. She was born Gil of a black mother and a white father and baptized with the name Anne. The circumstances of her birth disqualified her from any meaningful participation in social and econ economic life in a society which was based on racism. In Barbadian society, anyone with a taint of African ancestry, however distant, was considered the natural inferior of all persons of mixed European descent. When the Methodist Church sent missionaries to Barbados early in the 19th century, Sarah embraced this faith. And when white planters succeeded in boosting the missionaries of Barbados, she opened her home as a church and kept the faith going against physical abuse at one time, shots were fired at her home. She donated the land on which the first Methodist church was built in Barbados. She, there's much more you can find about her. She was only 28. Just imagine when she became such an active person, such a defender against violence and threats to her safety, they burnt the building down many times. This was a strong woman. Go read about her. I want to end. There are so many more, James Calvert, who went to Fiji, Amanda Smith, ex-slave, who traveled the world and went to Mumbai, James Strong from Strong's Concordance. I want to end with Henry McNeil Turner. But those are, those are some of the shining lights of Methodism. We thank Brother Fred for sharing such wonderful insights and it brings to our attention one of the important points of Methodism as we celebrate the priesthood of all believers. In continuing, we blend our rich voices again because we know that Methodism is steeped in him singing. And wherever you are this morning, we ask that you raise your voices. Do not think about what other persons might be saying. As we sing unto God's glory, where shall my wandering soul begin? Charles Wesley's conversion hymn, number 
prayer. Almighty God, who raised up your servants, John and Charles Wesley, to proclaim anew the gift of redemption and the life of holiness, pour out your spirit and revive your work among us, that inspired by the same faith and upheld by the same grace, we may fulfill our calling to seek and to save those who are being lost. In the pursuit of the ushering in of your kingdom here on earth, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our responsive reading comes to us from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. The Gloria. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it's now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Sisters and brothers, on this special day as we celebrate our Father's Gate experience for the founders of the Methodist community, John and Charles Wesley, today we will be having our Connectional Bishop, the Reverend Everett Galbraith, sharing the word with us, coming from Antigua, so you will not a change in the background when the sermon begins. But we give God thanks that we can celebrate today in this way and to have him, the head of the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas, break the word to us. I'll bring you the scripture reading from the epistle, Romans chapter four, reading from verse 13 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there a violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken his in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no, distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do 
what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I give you now Bishop the Reverend Everett Gower. My sisters and brothers in Christ, greetings from Antigua. I am grateful that your bishop offered me the opportunity to worship with you today and also to deliver God's message. The transition of Reverend Dennis Spencer, our faithful, dedicated, and hardworking connectional secretary, continues to emit shockwaves through the church. We have lost a valiant soldier and colleague. I have lost a precious partner in ministry. Thanks for your prayers and words of comfort and encouragement. May her soul rest in peace and the light of God shine on her forever. My dear friends, Aldersgate 2020 is historic. Today is exactly 282 years since John Wesley said he felt his heart strangely warmed and that he had the assurance that he was saved. His evangelical conversion led to the start of Methodism in Antigua 260 years ago. It is also the year when the chapel doors are closed and the church scattered in our respective homes. The church of God will survive, will prevail. As the people of God, we continue our efforts at spreading the glad tidings of free salvation in and through the finished work of Jesus. Today, the topic that I share with you is holding on to your saving faith. And the verse is from Romans chapter 4, verse 6, which reads, Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. God has promised eternal life if we have faith in the finished work of Christ. Saving faith is trusting Jesus Christ as the one who makes us right with God and gives us everlasting life. Through faith in Jesus, we appropriate God's free gift of salvation. Whatever happens, hold on to this faith. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask now your blessings upon these words as they go forth. May you anoint them with your grace and with your Holy Spirit and apply them to each hearer according to our needs. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. The church in Rome, started by Roman Jews who were converted on the day of Pentecost, comprised both Jews and Gentiles. Paul wrote to them, introducing himself to them, and in doing so he also outlined his beliefs, including his message about the grace of God for all. 
about sin and salvation, Paul said, all human beings have failed and are failing God because of our proneness to sin. But God graciously offers deliverance and abundant life to all. In Romans 4, Paul says that we must have faith to access this salvation. Faith here means being absolutely convinced and certain about something that you have not yet received. For Paul, Abraham was the classic example. God declared Abraham to be in a right relationship with him because of Abraham's faith and not his works. In fact, this was prior to Abraham's circumcision. Abraham continued to trust God even when it made no practical or physical sense. This imputed righteousness was God's undeserved gift, not a payment and not an achievement. On this Aldersgate Lord's Day, sandwiched between Ascension and Pentecost, between glorification and exaltation, revival and empowerment, I declare to you that we are not saved because of our achievements, efforts, religiosity or accomplishments. We are saved by the unearned, undeserved favor of God through faith in Christ and his finished work. The faith that saves us, the faith that allows God, God to declare us righteous, is the faith that is rooted in God's grace, rests in God's promise and relies on God's power. And these are what I want to share with you today. Rest rooted in God's grace. The choice of Abraham to be the father of God's chosen people based on God's grace. Grace means getting something that we need but we do not deserve. So, the grace of God is God's unearned, undeserved favor towards someone. Abraham was special because God made him special. Likewise, our salvation is rooted and grounded in God's unconditional love and grace for mankind. God's grace allows God to look beyond our faults, weaknesses, and frailties and love us with an everlasting love. According to Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, making it, making it explicitly clear that salvation is by grace through faith. The writer wrote, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If salvation were a reward for good works, then people would sing louder, preach longer, give more and do more to earn it. But hear me well, no matter what we do, how much we give, which day we worship, or how much water we used when we were baptized, we cannot earn salvation. There is no grounds for boasting. Speaking about this amazing grace of God, Dwight L. Moody in the book Day 
by day with D.L. Moody, he says, and listen to this, the thief had hands, both hands nailed to the wood and nailed through each foot so that he could not run errands for the Lord and could not lift hand or foot for his salvation. And yet Christ offered him the gift of God and took it, and he took it. Christ threw him a passport and took him into paradise. End of quote. Sisters and brothers, that is grace. And secondly, saving faith rests in God's promise. When God called Abraham and promised to make of him a great nation, it took decades. Decades passed and the promise was not fulfilled. When Abraham was almost 100 years old and Sarah 90 years old, well past the age of conceiving, God informed them that the long-awaited promise was about to be fulfilled. In fact, Sarah laughed. Laughed because the idea was preposterous, was whimsical, yet God insisted that it would happen because nothing is impossible with God. The impossible became possible when Isaac was born. God did for Sarah as he had promised because God is a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. Friends, never forget that God may appear to be slow by human standards, but God is sure. God is faithful and dependable. God does not promise what God cannot and will not deliver. Sarah and Abraham doubted, and so may we, but God will always come through. The promises and the assurance of salvation is based on the solid rock of God's love for the world. The word of God declares, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, verse 16. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Romans 8 and verse 1. God's promise is mercifully grounded in the inestimable goodness of God. And thus, the promise is indisputable to every human being. Whoever put their trust and faith in Christ Jesus have the right to the blessings contained in the Abrahamic covenant. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 we read, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And thirdly, Saved faith relies on God's power. The narrative presents a very powerful contrast between Abraham and Sarah's hopelessness and God's mighty power. In their prime, Sarah and Abraham could not conceive. Verse 19 says, Abraham contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and deadness of Sarah's womb. 
Abraham accepted the facts and faced the reality of their complete inability to conceive the promised son. When there was no possibility of Abraham and Sarah to say, at last we did it, God delivered. This awesome demonstration of divine power proved that God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Our faith and hope are not in ourselves or in our ability to do what is required. There is a popular teaching these days that Christians can declare and decree things over themselves and over others as already done. More and more we try to play demigods, but it will not work. As Steve Green in his lovely song wrote, God and God alone created all things we call our own. From the mighty to the small, the glory in them all is God's and God alone. Friends, our faith and hope should be in the God who gives life to the dead, who calls into being that which does not exist. Saving faith relies on God's power, the power that raised Christ from the dead, the power that will raise us on the last day. The power of God makes us confident in our belief in the resurrection and the life. What no human being can do, God can do. John Wesley needed that faith. And for many days, many years, many months, he, he searched and struggled to get that faith. The faith that saves. And during a Bible study on May 24, 1738, at 8.45 p.m., 282 years ago, the Holy Spirit lit a fire on his heart and a new day dawned. He was elated. He was satisfied because he now had the faith that saves. What about you today? Do you have, or are you seeking the saving faith? My friends, look to Jesus. He's right beside you and ready and willing to fill you with his saving faith. When you have this faith, this faith that saves, You'll be filled with joy, joy inexpressible, because you'll be filled with God. And so today I want to encourage you to seek after, if you have not yet received this saving faith. And when you have received this saving faith, hold on to it. Hold on to it. In conclusion, our salvation depends on God's work in Christ for us and not in our own achievements, efforts, or accomplishments. We are saved by the unearned, undeserved favor of God through faith in Christ and his finished work. In Christ, we can stand before God justified, not guilty. Therefore, salvation comes as a gift 
It is guaranteed to all and can be received by all, including you, by faith. Jesus offers salvation as a free gift because of God's love and not as something we have earned because of our strong faith. Jesus is strong enough to save us no matter how weak our faith is. Put your faith in the grace, the promise, and the power of God and receive the blessed salvation that comes to all through Jesus Christ. May God bless you as you trust him for Christ's sake. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we celebrate today. We thank you for your saving grace, your love for us, O oh God, that no matter who we are, no matter how far we have wandered from you, you still love us with an everlasting love and your grace still reaches out to us. Your promise is still available to us and your power to redeem us is still available. Lord God, help us to trust you, to trust you with our whole hearts so that we can receive the salvation that brings joy in this world and life everlasting. Hear us, O oh God. For Jesus Christ's sake we pray. Amen. We give thanks for the powerful ministry of our own connectional bishop, Reverend Everett Galbraith. I'm sure that having received the inspired word of God through God's man servant, that our hearts have been touched. And like John, our hearts would have been strangely warm. I pray that this feeling will linger not just only for today, but it will remain an ever powerful presence in all our lives as we continue to fan the flames of this wonderful ministry unto Christ Jesus. We blend our voices yet again as we sing our hymn of response, Salvation, O oh, the Joyful Song, number 140.
this point we're together again praising the lord it was certainly a pleasure to have you joining with us from the beginning of our service to this point and on behalf of our district president bishop t co finance i take this opportunity to just extend a warm welcome to you all and we also extend warm greetings to those who are celebrating birthdays within this week and those will be celebrating their wedding anniversary and especially we have a significant celebration in this dear land of Guyana on the 26th of May we will be 54 years old as an independent nation uh, we will not be able to participate in our usual mode of celebration but I pray that by God's grace we'll take the opportunity to reflect on how we have come thus far by God's grace as a nation. So Guyanese feel good about this significant milestone as we continue to look to God to take us through many more years as a powerful cooperative republic. And so I invite you to join us next Sunday, the 31st of May, 900 hours on our Facebook, YouTube and Instagram platform for worship and for those who are young and young at heart remember that on Tuesdays the District Youth Commission hosts a youth gap at 1900 hours and this is on Zoom. Our weekly Bible study will continue this coming Wednesday on the this coming Wednesday at 1730 hours on our Zoom platform and then yes for family month you know that we have a special focus that was designed with you in mind so we continue thursday coming as well 1800 hours on zoom and this will be a special space for men alone so sisters please do not come into the zoom meeting this is a special feature for our men the following thursday you will have your time and on saturday the 30th of may we have our children prime time at 1600 hours so i pray that you'll keep these in your calendar and that you'll not only keep them in your calendar but you'll make use of the opportunities available for worship and fellowship brothers and sisters this aspect of the worship has ended but our service to god continues and for those who are able I invite you to stand stand get up off your off your seat as we are going to sing the Methodist anthem and can it be that I should gain we should not have the strength and sit down and sing this one my chains fell off what a wonderful day and so receive this wonderful ministry unto God
four years as an independent nation this Tuesday in honor of this significant milestone we will be singing our national anthem which will be received after the benediction and so receive the benediction may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the Lord lift up the light of his eternal countenance upon you and may he grant you peace henceforth now and forevermore